Hello everyone, welcome to the Eureka Centre and the first event in this year's Ballarat Heritage Festival. And it's also the first panel discussion in our series, The Trouble with Heritage. It's now my honour to welcome Wadarong Elder Deanne Gilson to welcome us to Wadarong Country. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Director of the Eureka Centre, Anthony Chan, um, any council, the MPs that may be here, um, all of you, my fellow, fellow panel speakers, Kate, Jas, Louise Peggett, Juliet Hills, and Angela Benajari. So, hi everybody, I'm Deanne, near Warren, Yarra Deanne, Wadarang Aksinil, Wiriki Benganite Gayukanil, Kudna Mosbarin Bagarit. I stand here today as a proud Wadarang woman in front of you all and speak my language, the language that was lost for many generations throughout after colonisation. I also stand here um, having just completed a PhD in Aboriginal women's business and um, I'm very proud to say thank you. And I'm just awaiting my graduation ceremony. Unfortunately, COVID's affected that too. So, <laughs> um, Bengadak Jara Nichiwadarang Gurk, Gawa, Arat, we gather here tonight on Ballarat, my ancestral country. Ballarat meaning resting place. We're here for the Heritage Festival, the Ballarat Heritage Festival, to discuss where's my statue. Um, and while we do this, I'd like to actually have you all think about country. Um, I've brought a gum leaf along and the gum leaf um, is very important because it's part of our creation story. It's from the man gum tree. And the gum tree knowledge is connected to the sky knowledge, country and under country and the roots of this earth. And I think that's really important because without gum trees, none of us can survive. And if you look at the recent bushfires and all the burning, especially of the undercountry, that's a threat to all of us and this COVID. So I think, um, you know, that's just something I'd like you guys to think about tonight. And also that sovereignty was never ceded on this country. Bengadak Gayukanun Gutno Jaranich, Cutting Badabu, Windy Nirup, Bar Nirup, Harbour Cove. I honour and acknowledge my ancestors past, present and emerging. I acknowledge my mum, Marilyn Gilson, and my nan, Rita Dalton, and King Billy and Queen Mary of Ballarat, as, long, as well as John Robinson, my ancestor. We acknowledge Bunjil the Eagle from our creation, and Bunjil's rule states that we must all care for each other, country, and our children. Kimbani Ba Jarabagurk Yamkin We Ik Wadarang Jara, Urumalik Mamanik Nyanmina, Urumalik Wuriki Nirup, Wigal Mairi. On behalf of my family and in the spirit of my ancestors, I welcome you all tonight to country and pay my respects to all Aboriginal elders and all of you that are present here as well. So all Aboriginal people. Mokbara Bakup, Kita Kambanti. Let us all walk together, come together in friendship, love and peace. Kimbani Ba. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, such a pleasure and privilege for us uh, to have you on the panel um, and opening this event. Um, hi, my name is Kate Just, and I'm pleased to welcome members of the public and special guests to this panel discussion, Where's My Statue? Representations of Gender in Public Art and Collections, presented by the Eureka Center as part of the Heritage Festival Program. And we're the first event in the Trouble with Heritage series, comprising four um, panel discussions exploring contested aspects of heritage. Um, I also wish to acknowledge the Wadawurrung people, the traditional owners of the land on which we gather, and pay my respects to their elders past and present, and extend that respect to Aboriginal people, great Aboriginal people here today. 
a lot of our people have learned through the years, a lot of our country and consumers use that. But for tens of thousands of years, it's been viewed as a curse by other economies and institutions. For those who don't know me, um, I'm a visual artist and academic at the UCA, the University of Melbourne, and my own research and art practice involves medium, um, public art, cur uh, curatorial projects, um, and participatory art that explores ideas around violence against women, national identity, and the erasure of women from the canon of art and society. So I'm really excited to be joined by um, an esteemed panel today, also working at the very forefront of the issues of gender and cultural representation and visibility. I'm gonna introduce each person and ask them to speak to the podium. <laughs> um, so uh, Dr. Deanne Gilson is a proud Wadawurrung woman living on her ancestral country here in Ballarat, Victoria. Deanne has been working as an artist for over 35 years across paintings, sculptural installations, drawings, visual collage, photography, fashion, and fabric design. Through her practice and PhD research, Deanne aims to highlight and bring back traditional women's symbols and ceremonial practices that reference the lived experience of her ancestors. Dr. Juliet Peters, the far end of our panel, <laughs> is a historian, curator, teacher, and writer now based in Ballarat. Her interest spans classical art history, popular culture, feminism, and politics. She taught design history at RMIT for over 25 years. Juliet has been involved with the Women's Art Register for over three decades. These data's unstable outline queer and feminist narratives, like me, hi Juliet and engages with images and mythologies of the feminine. Dr. Anandita Banerjee, a twice uprooted Indian, is an acclaimed interdisciplinary artist and researcher now based in Ballarat. Using gestural portrayals of hybrid ritual, she wonders where her place as an immigrant is on the unceded indigenous lands of present day Australia. Having recently completed her PhD at Deakin University, her research interests include cultural otherness, authentic identity, and the sense of time. Louise Tegart is the director of the Art Gallery of Ballarat, a position she's held since 2018. Louise has extensive public gallery experience, including as assistant director, museum, and art gallery of the Northern Territory. She has curated over 100 exhibitions and written extensively for magazines and publications. Louise is the current president of the Public Galleries Association of Victoria and a committee member of the Victoria Foundation for Living Australian Artists. So the discussion tonight will seek to respond to the ways that our public monuments and collections have failed to represent gender and cultural diversity and reveal the powerful ways that our panel, all artists, gallery directors, historians, and academics are transforming this problem through their work. So before we begin the discussion, I'm gonna do about a 10 minute sort of introduction to the topic, a bit of a framework for um, how that we'll respond to for um, uh, works and discussions following that. So public monuments and art gallery collections are widely perceived to reflect cultural and economic value in communities. But the panel asks, who do they represent and how is that changing? What do our statues and collections say about us? Victoria has only nine statues of women who have shaped our society, or 1.5% of the state of Queensland. Of the 580 statues in Melbourne, 4.3% are women. There is a single statue of an indigenous woman, Lady Gladys Nichols, who's depicted looking at her husband. In contrast, in Australia, there are over 110 statues of Captain Cook. And there are few memorials to frontier conflict in the 19th century or Aboriginal heroes and resistance fighters. And this is complicated, so, and you can see from the quote by Genevieve Reed here as well, she, she comments, Melbourne's memorial landscape only represents colonial landscapes and heroes, indigenous people, 
of our most privileged women and our representatives. This is complicated further by the fact that female artists who've had opportunity, the few female artists who've had opportunity to contribute to public sketchery, such as Daphne Mayo, known for her Brisbane town hall facade, carved between 1931 and 34, um, contributed to the memorialization of colonial violence. We have this work depicting the road state, that's the theme I like to do at the center, sending forth her squatters and explorers with their beasts of burden, the horse and the ox. Cowering and cast out in the left-hand corner is, uh, is an Aboriginal man and a kangaroo. The carving is described in the Brisbane Sculpture Guide as symbolic of the municipal life and development of the greater city of Brisbane in its pioneer's advance upon retrieving Aboriginal labor and fauna. This sculpture, like many others of its kind, continues to create trauma, harm, and distress for Aboriginal people, and its removal has been called upon by activist groups strongly since 2004 with no response. The sculpture indicates the reality <coughs> that many, his, historically, many white women artists, regardless of their own oppression or lack of opportunity, have not and continue to not act in sisterhood or allyship to indigenous communities, a continuing problematic of feminist history. The specific lack of equal gender representation in public art also echoes statistical investigation of the female underrepresentation in the auction market, museum collections, and exhibitions. The 2019 Countess Report in Australia, which was, there were many um, reports over a number of years, sorry, and the most recent report surveyed 13,000 artists across 184 organizations. And it found that there was parity between men and women in the following categories, art prizes, art organizations, boards, and executive staff, and art administration. But the statistics on state art galleries were concerning. State galleries and museums continue to significantly underrepresent <coughs> women in their collections and exhibitions. In 2018, they exhibited 33.9% women and 66% men with no data available on non-binary artists. So what we're seeing around us is that so there's a significant public call for greater equity in museums and public space. And this is being accompanied by a global momentum around racial justice and gender equity that is being fueled by public protest and social media. The Black Lives Matter movement, the Me Too movement, and the COVID pandemic are all bringing into sharp focus long histories of institutional inequity, violence, and oppression. People are literally toppling and tearing down monuments to racist colonizers and demanding a public space that includes images and monuments to women and black and indigenous people, people of color and people with disabilities. Art institutions are being called upon to examine their own prejudice and bias in their collecting policies and exhibition making. Major exhibitions such as Know My Name at the NGA and Modern Women at Ballarat Regional Gallery are just a few of the many recent exhibitions seeking to redress gender balance in the arts. Though it should be noted that Know My Name sought to redress this balance with its exhibition while in the same year spending $6.8 million, more than half of its collection budget, on the work of Jordan Wilson, one white man from New York. <laughs> Good, good, good counterbalance to the exhibition. Artists continue to agitate for change and redefine our cultural landscape in ways that's more reflective of society's diversity where gender, race, and culture is, are, is concerned. Australian artists Jilly and Mark Shatner created 10 female sculptures in New York City to balance gender representation in public art and are unveiling a sculpture of Nova Paris in Melbourne this year. The New Ones Will Free Us uh, by Kenyan-American artist Lengechi Mutu is installed in the Met's historic facade. And it's a work which engages in a critique of gender and racial politics via an image of elegant and powerful African women. 
Drawing attention to the lack of visibility of disabled bodies in public statuary is Mark Twain's giant marble portrait of his friend Alison Lapper Pregnant, a giant sculpture in Trafalgar Square in the UK from 2005 to 2007. The sculpture created conversation around people's prejudices and greater awareness of disability rights in the UK, with many disabled rights groups sharing with the artist that the sculpture did more for disabled rights than anything else in the UK had for a long time. In Australia, many artists are engaging the problematics of patriarchal colonial inheritance and showing us how it's possible to acknowledge and transform a landscape of violence and oppression. Wiradjuri artist and ARC researcher Brooke Andrews Duncan Castle War Memorial features a monumental black figure standing proud atop Wiradjuri patterns. This contemporary war memorial for the indigenous people who died after European settlement questions what would it mean to jump on this heritage, this site of commemoration. Bearing a similar critique of a culture that celebrates white male monuments, Eugenia Lin is an Australian artist of Singaporean Chinese descent who works across video, performance, and installation to explore how national identities cut, divide, and bond our globalized world. Her project, The Australian Ugliness, is led by the gold-suited figure of the ambassador performed by Lin, the artist filmmaker who shape shifts as she traverses more than 30 sites across Australia interrogating the diversity, livability, and sustainability of the Australian heritage. Public artworks by other First Nations women artists in Australia are leading powerful interventions in the public landscape. The Unbound Collective's recent performance at the Art Gallery of New South Wales in 2019 involved public performances that speak back to colonial institutions of power as dominant repositories of knowledge. Marie Clark is undertaking a five station metro tunnel installation that will be revealed within the next year. And Yuani Scarce's architectural commission absence at NGV used stained timber and glass to challenge the false absence implied by Terra Nullius the colonial strategy declaring Australia an emptiness awaiting ownership. Haley Miller Baker's I Will Survive places female indigenous presence and narrative at the forefront of the state library and in direct proximity to Sir Redmond Barry in the forecourt. And our very own Deanne Gilson, <laughs> Muraflar Ancestral Stones in Ballarat further contribute to this groundswell of female First Nations practice of creating monuments that foreground indigenous knowledges, narratives, and power within public space. So with that very squeezed in background <laughs> to the topic, um, it gives me pleasure to get started on the panel discussion that will explore these the difficulties, but also possibilities that lie in inheriting, in, in inheriting this bias heritage protected space and seeing how our panelists will proactively respond to this. I'm gonna move over to my spot on the um, floor and I'll start with you, Deanne. <laughs> um, so your, your um, public artwork, am I pronouncing this correctly, Murav Lar? I think it's correct, yeah. Um, places ancestral stones within the landscape of Ballarat. Um, can you tell us a bit more about this work and how it operates for you as a self-determined monument? Okay, so the work uh, was made uh, to acknowledge an original stone circle that was here in Ballarat. And originally I thought I would put back what was taken away through colonisation. And uh, it is a contemporary artwork, so it's perfectly balanced. And I did try and go bigger with the stones, as had Jared, so we know we could have gone as big as Stonehenge if you know, we could have gotten in there. Um, it, it really just, uh, it's a, a ceremonial place, a place of peace, um, a place of worship even. Um, it connects to all the knowledge of this country um, all across Australia, really. The sky, the country, and the undercountry in those layers. And um, stone circles were originally used 
uh, to um, perform ceremony on the summer and winter solstice for, um, you know, a harvest, a good Murdoch harvest or um, fishing and all sorts of things. So it, it really was a place of worship. Um, but for me to it acknowledges my ancestors that were on this country and the gateway, there is a gateway. It is a man and a woman, their symbol on two stones, and that place is directly where there was a, um, a corroboree site um, uh, just across the lake there. So it invites my ancestors into the space and connects to them and the spirit of them and their knowledge. And, um, and it pays homage to them in that way too. And the stones too, because they're under country, they're so important. Um, the basalt is said to, the stone retains memory. So that memory, the DNA, and the object to itself is also intangible. It's a spiritual link to country too. So um, it does something else too in this space. Mm -hmm. That's um, I, I did kind of have a bit of a write down, so I thought I might forget it. It does something else that no no uh, Western made statue of a politician or someone can do. And I do have to put my glasses on. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I, um, so what it really does too is a European bust or statue would never do as it has no connection to country or um, it, it's removed from the real person and the lived experience. So the stones are alive, um, you know, they, they, they're a real living thing um, with the organisms and all the little creatures and things that grow on the stones and the mosses and all sorts of things. So they're part of country, they're from country, they're connected to country, they're a monument to my ancestors um, and they do so much more than just a cold old statue of you know, mm. a pork or somebody. <laughs> and also I just noticed from the opening on your website, the opening video as well of the work that it seems to animate a kind of community participation or create a site where other people are brought into a kind of, um, maybe you could speak a bit more to that because I, I wasn't sure exactly how that operated or if that's something that it will continue to do. Yeah, that, that was the opening ceremony and uh, Georgia, uh, Georgia was in that ceremony with mm -hmm. us too, being an Aboriginal woman. And um, so we, uh, we had a big opening and invited all members from the public. So it's a community space, a shared space. There is a man that meditates in the hut. And, you know, it's just, I, I think too, it's just one of those, it's a real calm space up there actually. Mm -hmm. um, and it also where it is too, on the water, it connects to the old, um, the old tracks of where people used to hunt and fish and, and um, uh, you know, our people used to walk and gather. So it's a gathering space and it always has been. And it was even when the miners came here, it was still a gathering place. So um, it is a community space. Mm. And just before, I'm, I'm going to move to Anandita in a moment, but I wanted to know <coughs> also what it's like for you having a kind of monument there in your hometown that sort of represents your connection to people versus, for example, these monuments that I've just displayed previously that are speaking to a kind of history of colonization. Oh, it, well, it, well, it just, it, it connects deeper, I think, and I, I think that's why, you know, it sort of came about because of that. Um, as I said, I it, I couldn't imagine you know my mum immortalising a statue, a bust up the lake yeah. or something with a politician <laughs> lane or something. Yeah. Be, I, I couldn't imagine that. But I, when I look at that, I can remember the opening ceremony with some of these beautiful people here, and um, and that memory, that that happiness, it it, it, it was living and moving. It created something different that was wasn't mm. just cold and. Mm. Dead. <laughs> Incredible. Okay, I'm going to just move as well now to Anandita um, and your transient temples installation. And I think it's a nice follow on from Deanne because you're in your work, you're seeking to acknowledge um, First Nations sovereignty as well as kind of interrogating your own history as a migrant. 
Um, so there's a questioning of your relationship to colonization. Can you speak to that and how that kind of comes through in this work and operates for you as an anti-monument? Sure. Um, it's lovely listening to you speak about um, speak about the stones here. Um, this work over here is called Transient Temples, and the central question of that work was how do I create my old gods on these new lands? And by saying that, um, what I mean is basically coming from an Indian background, we have sort of grown up with, and being a practicing Hindu, I have grown up with 35 million gods, and we have a god for every emotion, every question we have a god. So, um, but anyway, if you have ever um, been to India or if you've seen photos of, um, photos of India, walking through the streets and things like that, you'll, you'll often see trees or little um, nooks that people just declare to be holy places and they offer their prayers to it. It is, it is very similar and um, you know, similar to some of the things that you were saying, Leanne, we give agency to the land, to the waters, to, um, to the seasons, to the trees, etc. So, so that's, that's the background from where this work sort of, um, you know, the seed of where this work was. When I moved to India back in, uh, moved to Australia back in 2010, I was really, you know, in, in any public gathering that I went to, I was really taken aback by the customary, you know, one minute long acknowledgement of something that happens. For me, that was a big question. And then when I started, you know, um, maybe talking in places or things like that, I was asked to do acknowledgement of country before I started talking about it. And I was never comfortable doing that because to me at that stage, I it was a big question mark as to, you know, what am I acknowledging over here? You know, unless I actually understand and I actually, you know, have that um, place of, let's say, um, real feelings mm -hmm. and real um, sort of, you know, grounding of myself in this country, how am I supposed to acknowledge this country? So that's where all of this questioning started. Um, with this work, what I did was it was my personal acknowledgement of this country. So I think after having lived here for about you know, less than 10 years now, maybe more than 10 years now, actually. Um, I think I am finally in this place where I can maybe, you know, start doing things like trying to find home here and trying to, um, you know, very respectfully um, tread these lands and very respectfully maybe take permission and then offer prayers to my own gods and things like that. So this, this work was actually a culmination of all of those thoughts. And what I did was I actually went to the banks of um, the Hiriri River. Um, and it is a very strange place because the, dam the central business district in Hiriri is actually, um, you know, it's just on the river bank. But as if that central business district does not acknowledge the river at all. Like it does, it just looks, in, like, you know, it just ignores the river behind. So what I did with this um, work was I sort of went to the river over there and just found trees that to me were, that to me looked important. Mm -hmm. And that is without, uh, that is without the traditional knowledge that you have here or, you know, other indigenous people have over here. They looked important to me. So I sort of, you know, made them transient temples and, and then offered my prayers to those trees. And then as a performatory, um, performance, as a performatory installation, I invited all the, the audience that was visiting to sort of just take a moment, sit down on the ground over there, touch the ground, and sort of have, you know, have those questions run through our mind. And, and for me, it was like, you know, I am an un uninvited land, an uninvited guest on these lands, really, by coming to this land, by coming to Australia, buying a house here, settling down over here, and things like that. What am I doing? I'm actually subscribing to the colonial process. And if I think of it that way, I am actually colonizing the place all over again. So that was my, so it, it is my way of slowly making place for myself maybe and my family. And what I would really like to speak, uh, what I would really like to say about this particular work is, now I've got a, a, 
a really close friend um, and an indigenous um, friend. And most of what I understand to be well done about you know, being respectful to the culture, being respectful to the land has been through conversations that I've had with him. And he was really skeptical about me bringing a trauma to this country as, as um, an actor. So, you know, I sort of invited him, you come along, let me know hmm. what, you know. So he was really, he didn't want to come and he was really skeptical, but he sat at, behind the charana and did the, did the ritual with me. And for me, what I did was, you know, after I said my um, acknowledgement of country, I sort of gave everybody a piece of thread and I had them to tie it around the tree if they were willing as a promise to be mindful of, of the land they are on. So this friend of mine, he sat there, did the whole thing and then after, so he, he likes to talk to me, okay? Anyway, so after he has sort of done the whole thing, done the whole circuit, because there were other performances happening as well, he comes to me and he says, that that was really good, you guys, because I could actually, you know, I sat there, I listened to you talking, and I could, I, you know, slowly feel that the ground under my hands are getting softer. Mm. For me, he, you know, he doesn't represent all the indigenous people of Australia. I don't represent all the migrants from India. But for me, that was some kind of a connection that, you know, that, that was some kind of a furniture, not only that I got, or some kind of a furniture, you know, mm. um, that I got. So, yeah, that was family and family history. Mm, that's great. Thank you so much. I think what I'm struck by just listening to you both speak is how um, there's a way of making a monument in public space that's more connected to the landscape and, and potentially, in your case, more ephemeral that actually does create a much deeper connection within a community than what we're used to looking at, which is... Um, a great start to today. I'm going to jump those straight into um, institutional <laughs> context with you, Louise, because you're working right in it, in an institution, right, as the director of a gallery. And you've probably, in your time there, I'm assuming, seen a lot of changes as well to questions around women's roles within institution and visibility. And yeah, I thought it would be interesting for people to hear from you about your experience as a female gallery director and your, your own sort of imperative to put women artists on the walls. Sure. Um, I mean, I, my first job in the industry was about 28 years ago now, and my first job as a director was about 24 years ago. Um, so I've been doing it quite a long time, um, and I suppose, like most women, I've um, you know, encountered um, quite a lot of misogyny um, in my career. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about Ballarat. Um, and I suppose I just wanted to um, preface by saying um, Ballarat, Art Gallery of Ballarat, um, we, we think was actually the first public gallery to employ a female curator back in 1932. No, but nobody's told us that we're wrong. <laughs> um, and we were also, in 1968, the first um, public gallery to employ a female director in Margaret McKean. So there has been um, a tradition of women in leadership roles in Ballarat. Um, but I suppose my personal experience, um, even before I'd come to the job here at Ballarat, um, a former, a board member at my former job in the Northern Territory um, who had probably said about five words to me previously, um, took the time to tell me how lucky I was to get this job because there was a lot of very well qualified men who had gone for it. Um, I suppose then coming into the job over the last three years, um, there's been um, a, a range of responses from, you know, oh, there's a lady running the gallery now, to, um, oh, this must be your first job, um, through to outright bullying that's required, um, you know, HR intervention. Um, so I, I know I'm not alone in that. Um, I've spoken to a lot of other female directors who have been subjected to 
um, quite severe misogyny um, in their in their roles. And even today, I was just reading an article um, about that Dollar Mary Lees, who was the ex director of the powerhouse, mm. talking about. Uh, the criticism and misogyny that she had faced in that role. Um, so I think, um, you know, there's an issue with visibility of um, women in leadership roles in the gallery sector. There's a huge number of women who work in the gallery sector, um, far outweighing men, but in terms of leadership roles, there's, there's not a lot. And Lizanne McGregor from the MCA was mm. the sole... Um, person on the Council of Australian Art Museum Directors for mm. 15 years and conversely on the Council of Australian Museum Directors, um, Kim McKay from the Australian Museum was the only woman on that, um, that council for a long time as well and um, Janet Carding who's the Director of the Museum and Art Gallery of Tasmania is now on both mm. those but um, and, and Kim McKay actually um, started up a, a mentoring program for women leaders, which was really fantastic. Um, look, I think there's there's obviously been a change in Ballarat. Um, at the time that I was appointed, Sarah Kwan was appointed um, up at Sovereign Hill and um, just prior, Fiona Sweet took on the role at the Ballarat International Photo Biennale. So the three of us replaced quite long-standing um, men in those roles. Um, for me in my work, I think it's about choice and it's about, in terms of collections, it's about what is collected, but it's also what is shown. Um, mm. And um, I'm sure many people here are familiar with um, the painting Ajax and Cassandra, which is hanging in the gallery. Um, and, you know, there were quite a few people who asked me when I first started the role, was I going to put Ajax and Cassandra back up at the top of the stairs, which it had hadn't been there since the nineteen eighties. I don't know that painting. What is? Oh, it's it's, um, it's a work from um, the eighteen eighties by Solomon J. Solomon, which depicts um, the myth of Ajax and Cassandra. So it's actually a, a depiction of a rape scene, um, and yeah, a, a semi-clothed man but a, an unclothed woman. And for me, it, that was not an appropriate image to be seen as the first thing coming mm. into the gallery. Um, I think we're going to talk a little bit later about the Becoming Modern exhibition, but during the research for that um, exhibition, and I'll just have to check my notes about the numbers, but um, we, I worked out that um, up until 1950, there was about 800 works that had been acquired by the gallery, um, of which 28 were by women, and only eight of those had been purchases and the rest had been gifts. Um, and then I also did some number crunching, and I suppose this was kind of prompted by the, the Countess report. Um, up until 2018, we'd had 271 solo exhibitions by male artists to 138 by women artists, mm -hmm. and there'd been a 25-year period where there'd been no exhibitions by um, female mm. artists. So, I mean, we haven't um, specifically changed our collecting policy to, um, to acquire um, more female artists, but what we've done is actually develop a collection development strategy where we've actually identified um, key artists that aren't in the collection that should be in the collection. And just by virtue of what's been collected in the past, a large number of women. those are women yeah. artists. Yeah, yeah. And I would just note in relation to what I was saying in my intro as well, that um, so I had it actually, and I think I'd skipped over it, but um, the Artnet International Auction Database in 17 years found that women made up 5% of the total number of artists, but in the top 25 women artists, only one woman of color was there. And um, women of color, like or people of color, aren't included in the statistics of Countess. And I think that if you start breaking down the statistics actually of like who are the women as well, you find there's it's predominantly white women actually still in a lot of the museum collections. Mm -hmm. So 
it's an issue of patriarchy. There's a patriarchy issue of patriarchy, race, class, ability. It goes all the way down, and it's really still huge. And I mean, I'm wondering. I mean, maybe we're going to have to just to keep moving to so, so everyone kind of gets. We're going to keep rotating the questions. But I think that question might be good to come back to that question when we talk about becoming modern around collection policy, because I wonder what, how institutions can actually change without very specific strategic policy to change what they do. You know, but I mean, we probably can't solve, save the world yet. <laughs> so we might <laughs> um, move to just a question for you, um, Juliet. Um, You've been working as a historian and a writer who has been addressing under-recognized female artists in Australian context through your whole career. And over the week, we've been on email. I've been you know, connecting to all the different people in the panel this week about um, how this topic speaks to them. And um, you shared with me some of these kind of historical images of um, you know, some Australian women artists, including um, Daphne Mayo, Margaret Baskerville, and Ola Kahn. And I just wanted to get your thoughts about that kind of era of the history in the early sort of 1900s in Australia, which you sort of brought to my attention, and how, and how those women who struggled for recognition, but then also contributed to these <laughs> memorials. I think it's a, yeah, yeah, it's a very, very complex question. I think also another foldover is if you look at a lot of history of writing on about sculpture until about the 1980s in Australia, that sculptors of any, be they figurative or non-figurative, felt very hardly done by. That um, there was an old saying in the 1960s is that sculpture was the thing that you tripped over on the way to look at the paintings at the <laughs> opening. Uh, that um, sculpture, sculpture was not was hardly collected by public collections, and Ballarat was particularly interesting because Ron Radford, uh, Ron Radford made the decision to collect small interior sculptures. Uh, sculptors also were much more constrained than artists, whereas artists from say late eighteenth century and the Enlightenment, and the, very much the era of colonialism. Uh, foregrounded the agency of the white male and the white male creative was allowed to break free of the church, break free of the king and the state and paint whatever he chose to do. The sculpture, sculptors, sculptors were always very much more constrained by um, having to make money by doing public works and having to be commissioned by committee and having far less, far fewer options of creativity and having to stand within canons, um, particularly the art for Western people, the ancient Greek canon was much more visible in sculpture and was much more determined, that the sculpture was much more predetermined than a painting could ever be. So sculptors were always behind the eight ball, hard, hardly collected, and then they had various ranges of complicity with the type of subjects they were expected to do. I think in some ways it's almost too easy to knock the monuments. It's more the monuments are a channel or a medium through which the society talks and the disparity in monuments is not so much about um, problems with the practice of monumentalization. It's more about the society that commissioned, that commissioned the monuments because, in, as has been previously said, although we, people mock the bronze man on a pillar, he also, that type of monument also has strong relationships to totems, to religious sculptures. So there's always that sort of mysticism, this sort of representation of life. There is always something that's much more complex within a sculpture, and yet at the same time it's been harnessed to a very sort of capitalistic, patriarchal, civic sort of sense of worthiness. And in some ways, while we don't, we have, you know, where's my monument? While we have so few monuments, is that uh, women were not allowed to perform in those roles that were, from the 19th century onwards, traditionally um, celebrated by sculptors, which are, of course, are leaders, religious, you know, bishops, sort of um, military commanders, also sort of guerrilla commanders, so anti-state anti commanders, 
revolutionary figures. So all the categories, if the public men were public men, and there were very, until very recently, let's say the sort of 60s, 70s, there's been a greater liberalisation, small l, of gender roles. So I think in some ways we, these women did have a great deal of struggle. I mean, the other problem is, of course, is as we see with Daphne Mayer, they also were complicit in certain, um, in certain formats and certain expressions. And perhaps the Daphne Mayo sculpture, particularly with the physical, the physical sort of pushing away of the indigenous figures to the tiniest part of the and the kangaroo to the tiniest part of the tympanium, and of course linking that whole idea of that the indigenous people were often counted as flora and fauna of the land, not as citizens. Um, that's possibly the most agrarious one, and yet her biographer, Judith McKay, sort of said, well, she had to um, do what she was asked to do, and then she also gives an ex explanation. Um, there's been some very interesting scholarship about the two pioneer women's memorial gardens in uh, both Adelaide and Melbourne, and this is the Adelaide one, which has this extraordinary seven foot high freestone carved woman by Ola Cohn. She very explicitly deracinated the figure, and also, although she does look fairly sort of Mediterranean European, but she also um, took away there was no crinoline, no bonnet, no sort of no frilly handbag. She was not a colonial woman. She sort of tried to push it out of the uh, discourse about English gardens and civilizing factors of women. And there has been a that BA thesis written at the, in the history department at the University of Melbourne just about two years ago, which suggests that these are very complex monuments because in one way, the garden is about sort of women's civilization, the overriding of the, of the indigenous landscape, but it's also about women trying to put themselves within heroic post-World War I nationalist concepts of country and concepts of the nation as being the Anzac, being the pioneer, being the heroic man. And to some extent, this also, these, mon these pioneer women's gardens also reflect the idea that women can actually be part of the state, albeit a malign colonial state, but it's trying to insert women as actually having some presence within the state and actually trying to critique the sort of soldier digger male ethos that's mm. so so it's very ambigu ambiguous and yet literally these gardens which are both very english style gardens to represent the formal gardens that the women fought to cultivate around the homestead are also a very clear indication of the colonial overwriting of the actual landscape and the original landscape of australia and the erasure of both indigenous presence and in, in, in both metaphorically and in physically but um yeah so it, it's a lot more complex i do sort of feel sometimes that it's too easy we we have the low fly low hanging fruit of knocking over the slater statue but we then don't really critique say modernism and how it how it was tied up with colonialism in how it appropriated colonial and non-anglo-european non cultures and re, re, reinvented them and reused them without permission, uh, copied these cultures and then ascribed them to sort of white male genius, um, nor do we relate to the sort of the idea of modernism and purity and its ultimate expression in the, so we say, the concentration camp. There's a lot more, a lot, thing, lot of things that are complex. But these women had to fight. There was actual prejudice. Um, and one of uh, all his other works, um, the... Science and Humanity, for, done in 1938, sandstone figures on the, at the front of uh, Hobart Hospital. Uh, there was questions asked in Parliament because they were seen as too modernistic, uh, there were bare breasts in public. Uh, uh, humanity had bare breasts, and they said, why on earth has this been given to a woman? In 1898, the Art Gallery of New <laughs> South Wales commissioned Theodora Cohen to do a bust of... Uh, Montefiore, one of their, uh, Louis Montefiore, one of their trustees. And again, questions were asked in Parliament. Can we actually be certain that if the government has given money via the art gallery to a woman, is she actually going to be able to do that? This is carving in marble. Mm. This is a bust. Can she actually make a portrait that looks like the subject? Or is she just going to make a portrait uh, image that looks like a nice girl? 
Um, it was actually asked in the, for, for, in the uh, floor of Parliament in New South Wales, was this the right best use of commission, putting mon public money to use to commission a woman to do a bust of a trustee for the gallery? Mm, gosh. So, My sorry. Gosh. So, I'm, yeah, I'm just realising how we're just never going to get to the bottom of this topic. <laughs> um, and um, I have, I'm looking at the time, which this is the time we were supposed to go to questions, which is crazy. So I'm just going to run over time, everybody. You're going to be trapped here. Um, and and I'm, I, I, we're going to, because I want to make sure we get through at least one more round of mm -hmm. questions of, of the panel speaking to some of their work before we open to questions. And so I'm going to go to you, um, Deanne, but I'm going to do a little bit of a uh, cheat on you and let you speak to Cap the Cook Collective Impact and your mom's painting. I'm going to do like doo -doo 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 yeah. with the slideshow because these are both really important works because they are actually engaging with the kind of colonial history yeah. and um, narrative. So, so I'll get you to speak to this work first, Cook Collective Impact on water and country and how this work addresses these colonial monuments and their impact. So I made this work, um, gosh, 2018. And I, I essentially, when I was a little child and I was born in Melbourne, we went to see Cook's Cottage at Fitzroy Gardens and straight away when I was a five-year-old girl, I was terrified of Cook. So um, <laughs> it had always been in the back of my mind. And I made the work before you know people were really talking about these statues and everything it was just something it's lala falls our sacred site where bunjil map creation story flies over country and watches over us and and i thought wow you know cook's been he hasn't been here but he's been here hasn't he and um and i also uh, used some images from the art galleries collection um in their archives some early um colonial drawings that were done um, on Aboriginal women, especially I collected some of those uh, um, really highly detailed images of these, uh, you know, very sad looking people standing around naked and everything. And um, and so I also make a lot of clay works and I was doing this installation for uni and it, uh, Cook is actually collecting in his box from Cook's Cottage um, he's actually collecting the diamonds. So he's, uh, you know, I thought he's, that's what they were. I was like, we haven't they confirmed kind of that. Seed like, yeah. seed pod like. Um, yeah. But what I did was we've got a birthing tree that's fading out in the top background with the moon on daisy because our culture had faded out basically from history. And we've got Bunjil flying over. And I used my mum's Bunjil. I stole from her artwork. Um, <laughs> so to put that back, put her voice in there. And what I did in the right-hand side, um, I took a photo of Cook's window and I uh, put myself in there gazing back. So reflecting the male patriarchal, male and female colonial gaze. So I'm in a silhouette of like a Victorian woman's brooch or something. That's actually me looking at Cook watching when he's up here mm -hmm. um, and going, you know, back at you, I'm still here. I, I might look a bit, I might look colonised, but I'm actually still here on my country. Mm. So that was the whole point. Of and I love that it, it, it echoes that title in Haley Miller Baker's work, I Will Survive, mm. that sort of presence that resists. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I'm going to skip, I'm going to do a quick skip ahead to this image of your mum's painting. Um, so um, your mum Marlene is a painter and she, this is an incredible painting. I saw the NGV. Um, in the Colony Frontier Wars exhibition. Can you speak to this as well? So this work was commissioned through Pay La Bella uh, for the city of Melbourne. Um, and it's Tanam Minoue and Malabahini. And um, my mum was asked to paint this. It's the largest painting mum's ever painted. And uh, so mum, she was given all these photographs. So this is where the big market is and Franklin Street where they were executed. They were the first to be executed in Franklin Street and they're buried under the big market in the car park there with a lot of, um, a lot of other people. So um, only thing about this, when I finished my PhD exhibition the day after, we went to the big market and I went with two friends. One was an Aboriginal First Nations woman and 
the other was my friend who's quite an intuitive woman and quite um we went to the big market not to go to the big market we went to pay homage to them mm. in the car we were standing in the car park like a void all this noise going on and we were standing there and just you know um i guess connecting and standing there and going how can they be here it's genocide this car park. Mm. what can they be? it's kind of like surreal banal every yeah. day sort of scene of people just having yeah. their day out and we noticed too that everything went quiet in that space it was quite an odd thing to do really mm. and, and we did it organically we didn't really mean to do that it just happened and then i've been asked to come here and talk about that work what mum did with that work to strengthen the men uh they the original photographs she was given they were in the prison you know clothes um she didn't put them on the stage where they were at to be hung she put them in front of the stage in their traditional adornments and mm -hmm. their their own to bring them back to country and to that place of strength and knowing uh, so you know to virtually say it's my mum's way of saying it they are proud Ab tasmanian aboriginal men and look at them in their beautiful you know their, their mm. traditional clothing adornments as opposed to uh just for the city of melbourne depicting them on the stage being hung. yeah it rewrites um, history so it's like a history yeah. painting but it yeah. rewrites history so she has a little irony in her work that it's so subtle <laughs> you don't even know it's there but that reflecting that gaze back saying no and it was painted by an aboriginal woman so mm. and my mum grew up in melbourne so and as did i um yeah, we know the space well and and the story and everything so i, I guess it was just um i was very proud of her there's something else that went on with this artwork too on an emotional level uh, the toll it takes for you know uh, an Aboriginal person to actually go and paint something like that when you look at black lives and deaths in custody. When she painted this <coughs> painting, my cousin had just taken his life by hand mm -hmm. and his brother had also done the same thing. And, my, and she was painting, she kept saying, I, I'll draw strength from, mm -hmm. from Neil as she was painting this painting. I mean, Amazing. I don't know how she did it, to be perfectly honest so the painting then the painting goes past their story it's linked to her story because they're all dealing with the same things and it's 200 years later mm. which is kind yeah. of um the layers the layers of story and history and emotion and yeah i think that and familial trauma that passes down through generations, yeah. but it's very powerful act yeah. to kind of rewrite history and what that means for people who then encounter that in a museum context, like young Indigenous First Nations people to see that rewritten yeah. um, in a way is very significant. And yeah. I took my own children to that exhibition and I stood in front of that work and spoke to them about that work. And I yeah. think you know, to have these kind of parallel histories visible and be spoken about for the next generation, it's a really important part of how things could transform. Because if they're only going, like you say, as a child to the kind of cook's cottage and that's that, they're not getting the kind of um, present First Nations narrative around the history of this country and even the resilience. So it's also not just a picture of the trauma, but it's a picture of change, which is really very powerful. Um, do I have permission to keep going for like another sort of 10 minutes? Is the audience okay with this? Um, I'm gonna go, I think this is um, a, a good segue also to your um, work, Anandita, because in the work Settle and in Plate, your looking to acknowledge traumas associated with colonization and migration through ritual process in your work. And I wanted you to just, if you could speak to your use of materials and methods addressing trauma and healing in your own practice. So um, this is one of our healing rituals, Seti is a drawing on the ground with um, naked rice flour and water. 
And it is a very traditional drawing that we use in Bengal, um, in India. It may, uh, different versions of it are made at different, you know, by, by all the states in India, really, but uh, from where I belong, it's mostly dried flower and water. And there are two types of drawing that we do. There is one drawing that we do outside our doors, and it is to sort of signify um, that it is sort of a tell um, to announce to the community that there's something important happening inside. So that it's like a welcome um, outside the door. And then there is a, another, so this is mostly um, celebratory and um, decorative. And then there is another version of this, which is done where we offer our prayers, which is um, a ritualistic drawing, which we do while you know offering prayers, while um, while doing the ritual. So in this one, what I did was that glass bowl that you see over there. It has been um, made by um, by woodland glass. It has been slumped by rain, and the red the red sand that you see over there for me. As an immigrant, or before even I came here, Australia was this red island, right? So in this in this one, I I sort of um, think of Australia from a very touristy um, touristy lens. Mm. Um, so that red red earth or whatever red sand to me in this particular work is Australia, and that so what mm. I did in this one is sort of trying to again like like the previous work, trying to sort of you know, process my um, migration into this land and sort of finding home and finding belonging in this land. So I made the drawing on the floor saying, you know, offering myself to the land, saying that, you know, mm, offering myself to the land really. And then um, from this sand, so this, this works like a, almost like a pendulum, it is, um, and, and there's a hole in the center that sand falls through and trickles on the um, drawing on the floor. And it's almost as if I am offering myself to this land and saying, you know, can I belong here? Can I, you know, can I find home here? And as a ritual, what I did was for the whole, whole time that this work is installed at the gallery, I sort of at the end of every day, I clean everything up. And then next day, I clean everything up, clean from the floor. Next day morning, I do that ritualistic drawing again. And that same sand, is um, trickles through over that um, onto the drawing. So by the end of um, the exhibition, which is usually in a two weeks or four weeks, depending on where that um, has been installed, the sand actually gets lighter and lighter and lighter, as if you know we are sort of you know saying yes to this land. Yes, mm. kind of thing. So that's yeah. So there's a process in the work, and there's a there's an the implicit sort of process in the work and it's transforming as you're making it. Yeah. And this work um, uh, in plate, I, I wasn't quite sure what's going on in terms of the audience interaction and how that extends. Yeah, this one is actually, a, um, it comes from a slightly different, um, so it's still the same topic, but slightly different standpoint. So in this work, I'm actually acknowledging the fact that, or I'm actually <coughs> talking about um, colonization and how we share a similar history. So being an Indian in Australia, I cannot look at anything without understanding the depth or the complexity of of colonization. So, and it is uh, the, col the, the, le the level or the impact of col colonization in Australia is very different to that from India. And, you know, Keeping in mind and acknowledging those differences, I cannot sort of not think of the similarities. So this work sort of is, it talked about that. So what you see over here is a palm pie. It's a modern, you know, yeah. um, version of a fan. So in India, when the British came and they made their, you know, buildings and things. So and in, in India has a very humid climate. So usually people will wear, you know, really simple cotton clothes and things like that. So when the British came, they built really, you know, these big um, buildings and there were their courts inside these offices and things like that. And then they made use of um, these pankhas or fans. They were installed in all of these buildings, in their offices, in their private chambers, in their bedrooms, etc. And so the natives, um, which, you know, that's the term that they use for the Indians over there. So the natives were 
um, employed to actually fill those fans. So the job description was that they would have to be able to work 15 hours a day con continuously. They would have to be deaf because they would be sitting inside the rooms, right? And they would be filling the fans. So they should, should be deaf so that they cannot hear the conversation that's happening. Mm. And if they weren't able to work for those 15 hours, then they did not get the job. They did not get paid for the day. So in this work, what I did was acknowledging that, you know, the similarity, the uh, colonial history of India and Australia, I made an audio of um, the job description. So I read out the job description in Bengali and in English. <coughs> and as an audio, so this one, you know, when the audience um, member actually tagged at that fan, the audio would play at the speed at which they are actually tagging the fan. So I sort of, you know, um, inverted the power um, or the agency there sort of, so you know, the audience would have to work hard and sort of find that speed where if they are pulling it at that particular speed, <coughs> they would be able to make sense of the audio. Because mm. if they're pulling, if they're tapping it too I quickly, see. it wouldn't um, make sense. If they're tapping it too slowly, it wouldn't make sense. So it places so their kind of own embodied action into the, places them inside of the work in a yes, way. Yes, and talk, mm. talks about the labor and the Amazing. Okay, I feel like I would, I'm, I'm moving ahead, but I I want to I want to stay with you. Um, I just wanted to make sure that you have a chance, Louise, to speak to this work, um, becoming modern, <coughs> which was featuring Australian women artists from 1920 to 1950. The gallery. Yeah. So. Um, and the reaction to it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Excuse me. So I take it again. I have worked on a number of um, exhibitions featuring um, women artists, um, and including back in 2010, Slow Burn, which I curated at the SH Irvine Gallery in Sydney. Um, so when I arrived um, at the Art Gallery of Ballarat, I made an assumption, which turned out to be incorrect. Um, when I looked around the collection, I made the assumption that we didn't have any work by women artists that was curated because there were none on the walls. Um, and then it was really through getting to know the collection and looking at the collection database that I realised there was this incredible collection of um, predominantly um, works on paper, but some really significant um, paintings and sculptures as well. Um, so a lot of the, the prints had come into the gallery collection in the late 1970s when um, Ron Radcliffe did a, a groundbreaking exhibition called Outlines of Australian Printmaking. Mm -hmm. But the works had not been on display since then. Um, so I just saw this as, wow, this is just an incredible opportunity to showcase um, these fantastic works. Um, Interesting reactions, and I, I mean, I wouldn't mind just reading out um, some of the, the feedback. And um, I mean, overwhelmingly positive feedback, I've got to say. Mm. Um, I, I think the, the author of the, um, the positive thing that I'm going to read actually might be in the audience. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> um, but I just think it, it absolutely sums <coughs> up so much. Um, this exhibition is so strikingly beautiful in its content, design and interpretation that it made me cry, then angry. How many other galleries have such unloved treasures in their basements? I didn't know how much I'd been needing to see an exhibition like this until I saw it a week ago. I've been back three times. I feel cheated as an artist and as a woman, and I can't get enough of these superb, often modestly sized works that reach for excellence and find it nearly every time. How come I didn't know all these women fully and intimately so that I could have them as my peers, my art go-to girls, my special club of inspirers and mentors? This is brave, exciting breakthrough stuff in Ballarat. An institution that can be shy in its offerings is beginning to move from museum to real life, exciting warts and all gallery showings that reflect our history and point to our future. Becoming modern as a history project is brilliantly relevant to that 50% of the population whose works have been overlooked too often for too long. It's so good at the moment that I predict there'll be a backlash. 
too many women pushing too much women's work. Well, keep pushing, girls. We've had over 100 years of male predominance on our walls. Time for 100 years of our own. How good would that be? I thought that's that was pretty cool. incredible. <laughs> um, and then just some of the, the negative comments. Oh, um, yeah. So there was, uh, I got a letter from um, some members who were actually a, a husband and wife uh, who told me that they wouldn't be renewing their membership for the following reason. Sexism. What has struck us about the publications we've received in the mail is that suddenly the overwhelming number of exhibitions and activities are only about women. Another one, probably a conceived opinion, but the fact that exhibitions may be gender biased is of concern to me. And probably my favourite, which I think I want to get printed on a T-shirt. <laughs> Fire the director. You are pushing a politically correct agenda, which is basically annoying and is not in keeping with this gallery's past traditions. <laughs> <laughs> Even though many of those paintings have been in the gallery for about 70 or 80 years. So, I mean, what was interesting was um, immediately following um, mm. Becoming Modern, we actually had three exhibitions by um, Troy. We had an exhibition by Troy Emery, um, an exhibition by Cake Industries, which is two men, and an exhibition by Jeff Bonney. Um, all those exhibitions. They just seem neutral, though, to people. Yeah. Well, all and, then, and then as soon as there's women, it's, like, not neutral anymore. Yeah. yeah. Were advertised in the mm. same what's on that Becoming Modern was, but people just ignored that. And I think, you know, as I was saying before, it's about choice, and we just try and strike a balanced program. Mm. But... Oh, it, it was it was something new for Ballarat, and it mm. obviously struck and this a chord. Was in the same was this was in the same year the um, Louisiana yeah. King exhibition, which yeah. um, brought a kind of female artist into conversation with the collection. Yeah, as well. and that's um, mm. another thing that we we like to do is to to get artists to um, work with the collection. And I suppose if we're not um, trying to if we can't redress that imbalance. Um, in the collection immediately doing a project like this, I think, mm. is an interesting way of, of working with the collection. So this was, um, Solace was, it was actually t a two-part exhibition. Um, so this is only one, this is only half of half mm. the exhibition. But um, Louise Ann's work is very much about um, her relationship with the bush and with country and the place where she lives. And she tries to put kind of a feminine um, voice back into the country um, so this this part of the work was really about I mean these this gallery space had traditionally hung um, Heidelberg artists Australian impressionist artists um, mm. so she oh, this is mm. the other part mm. um, so she was really um, in that the previous slide um, was all images of, of women um, uh, be, as be, being observed by yeah. male, male depicted and observed by male artists. And the, the piece that she had done in the in the in the middle, the sculpture piece oh, sorry. Um, in the previous slide. Yeah, this one, yeah. um, mm -hmm. She works a lot with bronze, which is obviously um, often associated as a, a very masculine mm -hmm. um, heart, you know he heavy hard material to work with. But she she does these incredibly fragile pieces that she makes out of bronze, and in this case, she cast um, doilies, crochet doilies, um, some of which had been um, had been in um, sort of magazines in the in First World War um, templates, and then they were sort of sent mm. off to soldiers at war. So she's yeah taken this very um, heavy material and then um, transformed these very delicate ephemeral pieces into this mm. incredible artwork. And as I understand it as well, um, I don't know that we'll have time to speak about it, but Dita, you're doing an installation, right, that's going to be at Bellarat Art Gallery as well. And so I think like having um, what we're seeing happening is people are having conversations with other works or other monuments or other histories, which is really at least allowing a kind of activation of some of the questions that you know, we've raised it in the panel as well. Um, I'm going to give you the last question, Juliet, before we open to <laughs> everyone. Um, 
you, you've been involved with the Women's Art Register for many years, and I thought it would be great for you to speak to that work and how having a separate archive for women artists and non-binary artists has been important. And also just to ask you as an extension to that, to mention the Wikipedia yep. um, writing workshops, which are really interesting as well, because as we know, the web itself becomes like a kind oh, of yes, canon yeah. um, and where things kind of, you know, where things are held in the archive is really important. Well, I suppose the, I think, the importance of the Women's Art Register, and of course I think it's going to change now, is the politics of art have changed so much in perhaps the last 10 or 15 years. But war has always been a traditionally, and of course some people didn't even like you calling it war, it used to have to be called the register, but war was traditionally an open archive. It was part of a collection of similar archives made around the world in the 1970s, and it's one of the few surviving ones. And the idea was that Although it, didn't, it was a grassroots organisation that didn't collect, but if it collected information, people would become more aware of, the, of women artists. So it was both an archive repository, but it was also a tool for consciousness raising. And um, it's always been an open archive. Anyone who IDs as a woman artist, whatever medium, whatever style, whatever ability, could place their work there. A little later, after... Australia Council funding ran out, and this was more in the 90s when we were getting very economically stra strapped, to be able to put work in or documentation into the register, you had to be a member and a subscriber, at least for the year you donated. But we still get random donations of books and papers from estates and things in the collection. I think what's important about having an open, open archive is while we're tending to see now politics and quotas as enabling, as a tool to address ba redress balances or improve imbalances. A political concept of what is right or wrong in art has marginalised many artists who weren't in the cool circles. And in fact, if we're looking for, say, artists who are from cold backgrounds, who are not necessarily Anglo-Celtic Australians, apart from Indigenous Australians who do have some increasingly important career boosters, such as the Telstra Awards, such as um, many other exhibitions mm. and prizes that have, and also even sort of university courses that are being directed towards them. There are many called artists who are working within the suburbs, in local art groups, and are not recognised within a contemporary art context, as their interests and concerns often don't match with what is seen as the current preoccupation of what's correct, be it technical or theoretical. War has captured the good, the bad and the ugly. And I think it's only, I, I, this is one of my strong philosophies, I think it's only with a broad, barely lightly curated catchment that one can be certain of not excluding any artists who, the, who may speak to a later generation and to the needs and the philosophies of a later generation. I mean, you just look at Paris in the 1860s. If you said, who's going to be the artists remembered, everyone will say Cabanel and Bougereau. They wouldn't say Manet and Monet. So uh, mm. art, politics change, and many artists have been forgotten because of the way that politics change. Um, let's see, I was talking about the, if I've got to drop a few things, but going on to Wikipedia, that's particularly interesting in terms of sexism because um, we, it's a very complex I issue. Although we all enjoy looking at Wikipedia, those who don't write in it or edit it don't realise that it's patrolled by what I could call a rainbow coalition of males who, when they're not prioritising US culture, which of course does come very much first than above everything else, these males are prioritising what I could call global male interests, sport, most racing, <laughs> soccer, sci-fi franchise, TV series, films, tech, and um, things that are sort of classical, things that are to do with women, things are to do with non-global male cultures, all of which get challenged and put on the articles for deletion lists and then you have to have a verbal battle sort of in hidden hidden fora about why it should be there why it's important and anything from an australian artist to uh german ro living current day german royalty if they're not american they get a raise and the amazing thing is that when you fight these battles if you put up an article by about an australian woman artist uh one finds oneself fighting bros in Nigeria, Pakistan, the UK. The latter have their own specifically 
Tory brand of spectator self-righteousness about, oh, you know, what are we doing about men? You know, we are being a bit politically correct there, you know. <laughs> I'm sure all of you have... The sort of people have written into the Ballarat Art Gallery, as I say, it's sort of Tory spectator curmudgeon <laughs> sort of thing, and they think it's, they think it's witty and Python-esque. Oh, excuse me. Um, and as well, and we're fighting them as well as the obvious suspects, the bigoted white US incels and right-winged conservatives. Wikipedia is also policed by hierarchy, and the higher you are up in the official organisation or the semi-official organisation, the more your voice is heard. And again, a lot of this is dominated by men. But ha however, women globally, including in Australia and in many disciplines and many cultures, have found it safer to have a workshop. This is protected by the Wikipedia hierarchy. They recognise the workshop is happening, you register with them, and they provide high up soldiers to protect, <laughs> to, to police, to get, help you police it against the, um, the bros. I managed to police quite a few things, including everyone from Emma Minnie Boyd to Professor Anne Marsh, the major art theorist, mm. against the bros. But I've, I've had, uh, I've even had a woman from West Australia sort of, in t sort of writing me an email saying that her mother, the article about her mother's been rejected. And I'm just saying, well, you can't write about your mum. I'm sorry, the boys won't let you do that. <laughs> and, you've got, and you've also got someone who's watching you. So um, it's going to be very hard to get this article up again. But I think but, as well, so you, you, I mean, you, you've got to run one of these in Ballarat, surely as well, because I bet the regional interests aren't being promoted by... Um, I'm so sorry? I imagine the regional interests aren't being promoted by Wikipedia right, either, yeah. so... It's very hard if you get... Australian interests up or any any other interests up. Many countries now, of course, Wikipedia has become much more um, global and it's got it's in a number of languages. But say a country in which the lingua franca tends to be English, we tend to be slightly um, at a disadvantage because we're at the mercy of the Americans. So the some of the, there's a lot of interesting material if you can translate in the, the many languages. Mm. And it's no longer just in Latinate script. You can get Wikipedias in... They're all in the same format. They're all linked. And now you've got a software at the side that if you... You can click... If an article's about one person in, or one subject in one language, you've got a whole list of subjects in other languages that you can click on and you see the, respond, the corresponding mm -hmm. article. In Amazing. theory, you're meant to translate and bring material from all the Wikipedias into the English one, but it doesn't happen. But yeah, we need policing, and we've done them several times now. We're part of that. Lady standing there is Prue Mitchell, who is very high up in, I think she's the treasurer of Wikimedia Australia, so she's about the second or third highest person in, Aus in Australia on Wikipedia, and she goes around the country facilitating these workshops. We've done about four or five with, them, with her. This one, of course, is at the National Gallery of Victoria in the Great Hall, oh. uh, which I, was... I credit you for getting me in Wikipedia, you your say? tribe. I think you, you, I credit your team for getting me in Wikipedia. I, I wasn't there so, before. Yeah. So I... And of course, it's grown in Australia because you've got, um, we've done them in Melbourne. We've got Contemporary Art and Feminism with Katrina Moore have done them in Sydney. Uh, Angela Goddard at Griffith, at Griffith University has started, up, started them up in, in, in Brisbane. Uh, various curators include, various curators at the Crothers Foundation have done them for about three years in Perth. Always on in Australia, always on International Women's Day. I don't know about Adelaide. I think the director of the Tasmanian Museum of Art Gallery, she's also done a mm. feminist editor for But I don't know. So I think I assume there's an indigenous group because, again, you need to have a group policing the information. It's also about, because it's people can hack the articles and change them, so you do need to police them to make sure that the information is correct. Science in particular have got, and med have got now got, although it was meant to be opt-in, you now have professionals mm. the, um, looking at the articles so you don't get sort of strange health faddists editing medical articles. <laughs> but I, th I think on that note, um, so, so um, I, I, I'm very grateful to the audience who's indulged us to go really well over our allocated time. And I hope, I hope no one's feeling um, sort of overly stuck here. But I thought it really is important for women to just take up as much space as they want. With <laughs> I just want to um, take a moment to thank the panel members here today. Thank you, incredible women. Um, and it's been my pleasure and privilege to 
speak to you all in your work and um, yeah, to meet the Bellarat crowd. Um, thanks so much for attending today and I really hope the rest of the festival and discussions are really fruitful and it's important to have these discussions um, which can be sometimes uncomfortable but they're important ones to have and obviously we need a bit more time for them as well. Um, but thank you so much. Thanks everyone for tonight and thanks Eureka Center for hosting our talk as well. Thank you. Thank you.